I'm going to go ahead and just have it make a few notes here and then we'll introduce our speaker. Um, thanks everyone for tuning in tonight. This is uh, part of our lecture series that we do throughout the year. We've done um, one in person and this one we decided to do via Zoom. So we're not sure what we're going to do going forward. We probably will um, flip flop and do some in person and some uh, via Zoom, depending on situation. Um, but uh, just to introduce myself, my name is Megan Searing Young and I'm the director of the Greenbelt Museum. Um, welcome to those of you who are new to our programs. We're so glad you could make it. Uh, just to give you some background for those who don't know, the museum is a, um, is a product of both the city of Greenbelt and the Friends of the Greenbelt Museum. And we operate a house museum. We do lectures, we do walking tours, we do tours of the house um, and many other activities throughout the year. Uh, if you haven't already, we encourage you to sign up uh, to receive our newsletter. It's via email and we don't jam up your inbox. We promise it'll only be about one or two per month, uh, but that's the best way to find out about what's going on. Um, we have uh, upcoming this summer, we have, well, end of the summer at Labor Day, our Retro Town Fair, uh, which is when we invite uh, participants to enter in their baked goods and their crafts and their canned goods, um, vegetables, flowers, things like that. And then they're judged and um, we award ribbons to the best in each category. Um, stay tuned for more information about that. We'll get the, um, we'll get the, uh, all the information onto our website probably in the next couple of weeks. So turning to tonight, uh, we're so pleased to welcome our speaker, Kara Harris, who's a researcher and blogger uh, that we've wanted to have speak here for some time now. So we're delighted that she could make it. Um, Kara Harris is the person behind Old Line Plate, which is a blog that's truly chock full of fascinating and really well-researched information um, that Harris has collected from Maryland cookbooks. She maintains a database of over 50,000 recipes that are from Maryland cookbooks and manuscripts. Um, and some of which of those are housed in libraries and archives around the country. Uh, we were happy to have her come to Greenbelt to actually look at the, the we have a few uh, women's club cookbooks that she took a look at um, a couple weeks ago. And uh, she's appeared in both local and national publications, TV and radio, including the Baltimore Sun, CBS Mornings and WIPR. We do ask that you hold your questions until the end or you can put them in the chat and we'll keep track of them that way. Uh, and please join me in welcoming Kara Harris. All right, um, you can hear me okay? Okay, good. Um, yeah, I want to thank you for having me. I'm excited to do Greenbelt since I'm kind of from the area. Um, and as she mentioned, I was in the other week actually uh, looking at some books that I've wanted to look at for a long time. Um, this Greenbelt book from the 90s in the corner, I borrowed it from a friend and it mentions this historic book that's in your collections. So I finally got a chance to take a look at this really great item as well as some other stuff in the collections. Um, so it's just really fun to see stuff from around where I'm from. All right, so um, if you had to choose, um, if you had to choose one recipe to contribute to a community cookbook, what would influence your decision? Would you choose something that you make all of the time? Maybe something you make for special occasions? Personally, I might pick something that I'd gotten the most compliments on. Next, you go down, uh, go to write down your recipe and you have to make some choices. When you write down, um, you know, I might imply that I only use certain quality of ingredients because I want to put forth the best version of my dish. Or maybe I'd look at how much sugar and butter is in my recipe and say, that, that can't be right. Maybe I should start cutting that back a little bit. Um, and if you're a cook who improvises, how do you write down that process? By writing down, you're deciding the one way, the best version of your recipe. Who knows, maybe one day your version could become the only authentic way to make that dish. That's a lot of pressure. Um, I study culinary history, but my specialty is the recipe and they're not always the same, especially the further you go back in history. Um, cookbooks and recipes have been around for centuries, but in the 1800s, there was this cookbook boom. There were a lot of reasons for all of these books suddenly being published. Uh, social changes like the end of slavery might have left some women without a knowledge of how to cook certain dishes. The idea of domestic science in general was rising. This is Fanny Farmer. She popularized the idea of using standard measurements for cooking. Before that time, things would call for maybe a teacup of butter or a salt spoon of this or that or a wine glass. 
So when you reach for these standardized cups and measurements, uh, mm -hmm. we really have her to thank for that. Um, you had social reformists who were pushing new ideas about nutrition. There was an idea spreading that it was a woman's responsibility to feed her family nourishing food. On the other end of the spectrum, you have women like Mrs. Charles Gibson, or this is Mrs. Benjamin Chu Howard um, here in Maryland. After the Civil War, their way of life was in decline. So they compiled books of recipes as a way to kind of continue the nostalgia for the antebellum era. You look at these recipes and you kind of believe it's a time of good and plentiful food. Um, but of course, we can't forget what made their lifestyle possible. Um, a lot of church groups published books to benefit charity or benefit their social clubs. Um, overall, I think that one of the primary drivers of this cookbook boom was just that it was a neat thing to do. Um, you think about social media showing off pictures of what we eat. That's what a lot of these books were like, hundreds, sometimes thousands of recipes. As I started to explore these cookbooks and make their recipes, I soon learned the difference between recipes and cooking, especially historic cooking. At first, I thought maybe I could just follow a recipe line by line and get a nice little organic chicken and I'd be really tasting history like some kind of a time machine, um, but it really didn't quite work out that way for many reasons, uh, some of which I'll go into. The biggest issue would be with ingredients. Um, we actually have no idea what some foods used to taste like. Flour, the kind of wheat that is used in all-purpose flour in the grocery store can't even really be grown that well in Maryland. So millers and bakers would create their own blends depending on the purpose. The flour could vary from mill to mill or household to household. And then from year to year, the texture of bread could have been wildly different. And then the same is true of yeast. Yeast would come from the air or from a byproduct of beer brewing. There's many different kinds. So the one kind that we buy at the grocery store is representing only a single possibility. Um, also, a lot of old recipes are pretty vague. Standard measurements, consistent ovens, or maybe even having an oven at all didn't become standard until the 20th century. When a lot of these recipes were written, it was assumed that cooks would have a good amount of prior knowledge. Recipes for baked goods might list the ingredients, but then just say, cook it in a slow oven. Sometimes they wouldn't even remind you to cook it at all. Um, like this donut recipe that ends with wet it with milk into a light dough and set to rise. Uh, meat recipes, I sometimes wonder why they even bothered to have a recipe at all. Um, I have a recipe for an English meat pie that calls for any kind of cold meat with a rich gravy or butter. For cooking raw meat, they would just say, stew it until it's done. Um, old cookbooks are a lot like that. Many of the recipes sometimes were copied straight from other books, uh, never tested, or they were printed just to show off the author's social status, huge quantities and how much butter and sugar or how much hired or enslaved help she could afford. Um, still, I've made hundreds of recipes at this point, and I've indexed tens of thousands of them into my database, so obviously I find some value in them. Um, even what people wanted to project with these recipes can be interesting their wealth, their thrift, their skill. Um, by comparing the cookbooks over time, you can see fads or the gradual adoption of different technology. There might have been a time when the refrigerator and the chafing dish both seemed like exciting new things that would be around forever. Um, I don't think I even see chafing dishes in thrift stores very often anymore, but at the turn of the century, they were all the rage. Um, I also just love community cookbooks. They all have their own personalities. Um, people would add their own recipes in the margin. Every church cookbook is a historical document full of names, people who have backstories and recipes that reflect the changing times. Um, you can find out so much. This um, was a more recent story that I came across a woman who kind of pioneered transporting her vegetables across the bay by plane. Um, and she was a widowed farmer on the Eastern shore. I just find all these backstories to these women who contribute these recipes to books. Um, I can't even get into all the people here, but you can see the very different lives and characters that I've come across by making their recipes. Um, the women who compiled these cookbooks were also very marketing savvy. They sold ads to local businesses and also they incorporated new ingredients, essentially product placement. Um, baking powder is one of the biggest examples. It was a revolutionary new ingredient in the 1800s and people had to learn how to use it. 
Some people were wary of it being a dangerous chemical, but these home economists put out cookbooks with reassurances that it was safe, plus a lot of really tempting recipes. I think I used to at least think of the past as being kind of pure and free of commercial influence, but I've learned that there's really a fine line between a corporate cookbook and a community cookbook. It was kind of a give and take. Um, the advertisements in these Maryland cookbooks are sometimes the most interesting part. Um, some local books have a lot of ads that demonstrate a whole neighborhood's worth of local businesses at the time the cookbook was printed. It's like a phone book. You get a window into what kind of goods were available or how or why they're being advertised in the first place. Ads for grocers are a window into where women might shop. Ads for appliances show what would be the cutting edge kitchen equipment at the time. In some cases, you can piece together some social ties as well through the last names in the ads. Maybe the businesses were families in a particular church or business associates of a popular woman's husband. Other women created these personal cookbook manuscripts. It was a very popular thing to do. They would compile books of recipes from people they knew and even from women's magazines and newspapers. Newspapers were actually a big source of recipe and um, they would share recipes all over the country. So sometimes these recipes weren't quite as local as you would think. Um, later newspapers would share recipes from readers. And when I cook these, I often do more research on people and you can trace their whole life through stories and recipes. This woman was a civil rights activist named Lillian Laudier. Um, and she contributed a cake recipe, but I also found stories about her different activism and things about her marriage and milestones in her life. Um, same with this woman, Fanny Jo Reed, her husband owned a record store in DC. And she was actually given a column because her recipe that she sent in to the Afro-American was so wildly popular. A lot of women really did try these recipes as soon as they saw them in the paper. Um, this was from the Delmarva chicken contest. I found a woman who won this contest who commented on different things like the moon landing years after she'd won this contest and she lived to be over 100 and commented on the different changes in her Eastern Shore community. Um, newspapers have also opened my eyes to the dark side of historic food, which is the fact that a lot of people used to die from food poisoning. Food could be very unsafe. I see restaurants and cookbooks talking about the good old days now, but when all those mass produced and canned vegetables came to the market, people were happy for the convenience, but also for the safety. Now here in Maryland, many savvy recipe and cookbook authors capitalized on Maryland's fame. Maryland food used to be famous across the Western world. One Baltimore caterer shipped his terrapin soup, allegedly, to London. Um, deviled crabs were popular as far as crabs could safely be shipped. Canvas back duck was famous far and wide, and Maryland fried chicken used to be a standard for luxury hotels and railroads. Um, it was served, you can see here, aboard, aboard the Titanic, chicken a la Maryland. Um, not many people even know what Maryland fried chicken is anymore. It's generally fried chicken served with a cream gravy, but there's a lot of debate when you read about it. Some recipes call for it to be served on a waffle. Um, deviled crab was kind of the forerunner of the crab cake, and sometimes it has very similar ingredients. Aside from oysters, this was really the pinnacle of Chesapeake food that people expected to get in Maryland. It was popular right up to the 1950s. When crab meat was industrially picked, um, usually in Crisfield on the Eastern Shore, they would ship the shells alongside it so that the crab could be served this way in restaurants. Uh, crab cakes have been around since the 1700s in some form or other, but they didn't really become so popular until the whole Maryland fine dining mystique was starting to fade in the 1950s. The times had changed and tastes had changed. Uh, people were not traveling and dining as they once had. Plus Maryland had a culinary reputation that was really heavily staked in the whole plantation mystique, um, which of course during the 1950s and the civil rights era was declining in popularity for obvious reasons. Um, but although Maryland's reputation, our dining scene was kind of concentrated in Baltimore, it actually was spread all over the state. Uh, this, there were hotels in places like Cumberland on the railroad, and there were inns around the state like the Olney Inn, which was famous for serving Southern fare. Um, one DC area cookbook in my collection is called the Melwood Cookbook. It was produced in, up, uh, in the Upper Marlboro area of PG County by Mrs. Percy Duval. She was born in 1864 in New York, but 
She's quoted as fancying herself a daughter of the South. She called her home Dower House and travelers to and from DC would stop in on the way for her famous meals. And that's her chocolate ice cream recipe that I made. It actually tasted a lot like a frosty from Wendy's, interestingly enough. Um, another of her neighbors who contributed to the cookbook was named Rosa Lee Binger. She lived in a house called Mount Clare. In the early 1900s, she took prizes in the state fair for her rolls and sweet pickles, a lot like that contest that um, was mentioned in the beginning, which I might have to come down and check that out. Um, she, so Rosalie Binger also contributed a lot of recipes to the Melwood cookbook and I made her, this is her pineapple rhubarb marmalade. Um, so outside of that book and a few from local hospitals, the DC area didn't really produce a lot of cookbooks until the suburbs got built up. Um, from the 1940s to the present day, a lot more books were produced locally by clubs and schools and churches. And this is just a few of mine, including um, a book where I'm from in Beltsville and a book that was raising money to stop the stadium being built in Laurel, Maryland. Um, so even if these books aren't 100 years old, they're still pretty special to me because there's just not as many. Um, another good source for local recipes is newspapers. Again, um, home economists worked as columnists for the paper. They would share recipes or they would facilitate readers exchange of recipes. And this still happens to some extent today. College Park, uh, University of Maryland College Park, I should say, actually had a home economics program that educated a lot of the home economists who went on to contribute recipes to cookbooks like this one, Maryland Cooking, which was put out by the Home Economics Association. Um, or the women would go on to teach home economics or write for these newspapers. I could basically give a whole talk about the home economists, so I'll cut it short there. But when you get into their heyday in the 40s and 50s, we have so much more going on. Women learning how to use electric and gas ovens, other electric appliances, um, like the chafing dish, the bread maker, um, there was also the scarcity in the 30s that led people to cook a little bit differently, followed by food rationing that had people, for instance, using maple syrup instead of sugar in a lot of baking. And of course, throughout all of this, there were corporations coming up with new ways to use their product. If you see a recipe for a cake with a weird ingredient like tomato soup, sauerkraut, or mayonnaise, there's a chance it was originally cooked up by housewives or home economists, but you can bet that it was probably made popular by the corporations that sold those products. Um, all of these things changed the way that Americans eat and also contributed to the increasing irrelevance of Maryland food. Um, when the Pillsbury Company started their Bake Off in 1949, I've collected the different cookbooks that they put out with the winners each year. And what I found when I looked at these books is that there's not any recipes that have Maryland in the title. Before this time, you would have recipes even for Maryland cream waffles or Maryland, um, you know, the Maryland fried chicken, Maryland baked liver, believe it or not. Um, but you don't see Maryland in any of these recipes and actually very few of the winners are even from Maryland. Um, so even though it's no longer world famous, I would say that Maryland has a pretty unique food culture unlike anywhere else. Um, we have the Pennsylvania Dutch influences from the Pennsylvania area, um, Scrapple, smear case, cheesecake, um, uh, sorry, smear case is a cheesecake that's found mostly in Baltimore. And this is peach cake, which is German in origin. In Thanksgiving, people eat sauerkraut with turkey at Thanksgiving. These are Fosnox, which are served on um, for Lent, pre-Lent, like Fat Tuesday. Um, we also have the Catholic traditions in Southern Maryland where you can still get stuffed ham, um, maple syrup from Western Maryland, which actually used to be rather famous. And of course we have all the food from the Chesapeake Bay and its tributaries. When the first European explorers came to Maryland, they were blown away by all the food around them. Um, we also have that Southern influence, the beaten biscuits and the complicated baggage of that kind of grand plantation cooking that made its way into hotels and restaurants. Um, if you leave my talk with anything today, hopefully I think um, you should be inspired to, sorry, I should have scrolled through these corn sticks, this beautiful map of Maryland showing the different regions of some of the food. You have the game in Western Maryland. We have different 
uh, produce grown. Actually, Anne Arundel County used to be famous for strawberries. Um, and you can see they're also grown on the Eastern shore. I think somebody mentioned terrapin that actually used to be very famous. And I have a lot of recipes for the terrapin soup. Um, so I would like to inspire people a little bit to document your own recipes, um, whether they're your dishes you like to eat and make regularly or dishes you make for friends or even things that you wanna try. Um, they're all part of your history. I'm still very interested in culinary history. I'm still learning as I do this. I find new books and manuscripts constantly. When I started a blog based on my database, I committed myself to doing two years of about a recipe a week. Um, and, oh, here, sorry. Um, and I have no end in sight to that. I think I talked a little too fast, so we could get into Q&A if that's okay. Um, yeah. Can you hear me? Yep, we've got you loud and clear. Yeah, um, I talked way too fast um, for that, but make, hopefully we have some questions. I have there, some other slides I can pull up and talk about if not. I don't see any questions yet. Oh, we have a hand raise. Uh, Brianna Hi there. Has a question. Hi, yes, Brianna January. Um, I've been following your your social media journey. Um, super exciting, really interesting stuff, both as a Marylander and a history buff and someone who loves to do um, cooking and homemaking myself. My question, where's the best place to source um, historical recipes, regional recipes, in your opinion, outside of, you know, the typical pass me downs from family, neighbors, etc.? Um, I couldn't really say there's one best way because people contributed recipes in so many different ways. Newspapers are a resource that are pretty much endless. Um, if you get a, um, if your library has a subscription to historic newspapers, you can find a lot of local columns in there. Um, I find a lot of recipes just by searching for the names of things and people would request and share their family recipes for peach cake and things. Um, but also those church cookbooks, um, they're getting increasingly popular as I know because it's getting harder for me to buy them. But they turn up at thrift stores and on eBay and um, you'd be surprised even up through the 80s and 90s that you can find some really historic recipes in those books actually people share things that they really care about so um so that's not really a very helpful answer if it's maryland recipes the answer would be um you can ask me and look at my database and my website <laughs> but for other states i would say start with the community cookbooks and the newspapers We have uh, Jim P with his hand raised. And then I'll get to some questions in the chat. That sounds good. Yeah, I have uh, two questions. Uh, the first is, is that, so that uh, one Maryland cookbook, I have the Maryland cookery. The recipe for beaten crab, beaten uh, biscuits is to beat the biscuits for like 30 minutes. Is that yeah. the traditional recipe for beaten biscuits? Um, um, yeah, that is. So that came from a time before there was really leavening. So you're basically beating them so that the gluten gets so tight that you're beating air into the biscuits. Um, I've read, there's some debate on this, but I've read that some um, like Quaker cookbook authors from the era of the 1800s actually associated the beaten biscuits specifically with slavery because it was a thing that a lot of people didn't have time to make and would use enslaved help to make. But certainly I've also found a lot of evidence that people do make these at home. Um, because, you know, they like the flavor and it's meaningful to their family. Um, but there's actually a really great photo of one of the Eastern Shore, um, the last vendors who used to make these, you can't usually buy them anymore. Um, and they're standing in front of their biscuits with an ax. And it was probably taken during the 1980s and they would make these and just um, go at them with an ax and sell them to people who were accustomed to that as a traditional food. I had a family friend who commented on those. She's like, oh, such good memories, but they're real hockey pucks, she said. <laughs> I tried making them and I actually got a lot of um, flack from people who feel so passionately about them because they're very hard to make and mine got dry and they looked kind of, um, they looked pretty worse for the wear from the beating. So, you know, 
a lot of people probably could school me and how to make those and they, they let me know. Yeah, and the, and the other question I have is, is I, I picked up an old cookbook at a, at a uh, book sale. It's a local cookbook uh, because it has local ads in it, but it's, uh, it's, let me see if I can show the cover. It's uh, SDC. And I have no idea what SDC is. I was just wondering if you had any, if you've come across this and any idea of what, what SDC is. No, I imagine maybe it has to do with the church. Does it not say on the um, the inside, like usually on the one of the inner pages, because some of these community cookbooks, they would just basically stock covers. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, I had a photo where I had said identical covers. So sometimes you. I mean, it's, yeah, I think it is a church, but, but it just refers to it as SDC and that's it. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Yeah, I'm not sure. Maybe someone else um, might know that. They might be familiar with the organization. All right, thanks. Yeah, sorry about that one. Uh, we have a question in the chat. Uh, someone says they have a copy of the Maryland Way cookbook. Could you talk about that particular cookbook a bit? Um, yeah, that's a great Maryland cookbook, especially if you really want to get one Maryland cookbook. That's the one I always recommend. Um, it was put out in the 1960s by the Hammond Harwood House, and they went through a lot of historic manuscripts and um, the woman who put it together, um, I wanna say Mrs. J. Reenie Kelly um, and her, um, her maid actually, her name was Alice Brown. They went through and they updated a lot of the recipes. So it's a little bit less cook it till it's done. Uh, the instructions are a little bit easier to follow and the book is absolutely beautiful. There's prints of old menus and things in it. So um, it's a real treasure. That sounds cool. Um, there's a question about the gastronomic map, that beautiful map you had up. Um, there's an animal uh, in one part that someone's asking about if that's a possum. I believe it is. Let me um, exit my, just go back here. Um, but yes. Um, no, we, it, it could be a muskrat, oh, right? Yes. We're looking at the muskrat that's under the swan. Yes, yes, yeah. I think so. That is a muskrat and muskrat stew is a dish that shows up in some of my um, local cookbooks and that, um, yeah, I was actually talking to a writer named Katie Livy who do, does food writing on the Eastern shore <laughs> and she grew up having that occasionally and is not a big fan. Um, but I, I tasted it once at a Maryland Historical Society event and it was not bad, it was just highly seasoned. So I didn't maybe really taste the full, um, the full effect of the muskrat, but sure. muskrat stew is a very traditional Eastern shore recipe. Very interesting. I wondered what that animal was myself. Um, can, another question, can you talk a bit more about the specific style of Maryland fried chicken? You mentioned it and talked about it a little bit, but can you explain that a little more? Yeah, I've done a lot of research to try to figure out um, what exactly makes Maryland fried chicken. I found some evidence that led me to believe that people almost called any fried chicken Maryland fried chicken in the 18, around the 1870s and 80s. Um, there's one technique where the chicken is fried and then the lid is put on the pan and the chicken is steamed. That's highly controversial because then the chicken won't be quite as crispy. But you do see some recipes for Maryland fried chicken that call for that step. But by far the most common thing that makes it Maryland fried chicken is you fry the chicken, you pan fry it, and then drain the oil, but kind of keep the pan drippings and make a cream gravy. And then you serve the chicken with the gravy on the side. So Interesting. you can pour it over on a waffle or something. And I think that's what most people, if they've heard of Maryland fried chicken, that's what people would think of now. Although there are also people who think that uh, Maryland fried chicken just means it has Old Bay in the season. Right. <laughs> so you, you can always combine those two things, so. My great grandmother um, made oven fried chicken, so she wouldn't actually fry it in a fryer. She would bread it, but then put it in the oven. So, I'm sure, that's a variation you've seen too. Yeah, um, yeah definitely. Someone mentions that Everything. culinary historians of Washington D.C. have a collection of historical cookbooks at the Smithsonian that you can see by appointment. That's a cool tip. Um, next question is: What prompted you to study recipe book history? Um, and of the recipes you've tried from the old recipe books, what do you have some favorites? And then finally, what's the difference between, what is the difference in a recipe book and a cookbook? Um, I'll, I'll go backwards from that one. A recipe book versus a cookbook. I 
I don't think there necessarily is a difference. I would think of a recipe book as one that's personally compiled those manuscripts where people pasted things or got recipes from their friends and is really more of a collection. Sometimes it would be something that they were so used to making that they would only list the ingredients um, or just take personal notes. Whereas a cookbook is really more presented for the public. So it's being put out there to try to help other people cook. Um, but a lot of cookbooks throughout history, they'll be called a book of receipts. Originally a recipe was just called a receipt. So you see a lot of variation. It's not really until the modern day that we start to call it a cookbook and to spell cookbook is one word. Um, I think the question before that was what made me want to try. Um, I just didn't have a way to try some of these dishes. I have this set of cookbooks called the Southern Heritage Cookbook Library. And I found a bunch of recipes in it, which I later determined came from Maryland's way. And there's recipes for Maryland baked liver and Maryland white potato pie, the Maryland fried chicken and the Maryland stuffed ham. And I did not know of a restaurant where I could get any of these things. So I just had to make them. I've always been kind of a blogger, just putting my interests out there, whether it's music or anything like that. So I just, it seemed like a natural thing to do. Um, and as far as favorite dishes, I actually more have favorite techniques I've picked up from historic cooking. Um, a, an ingredient that they used to use, for instance, is mushroom powder. Mm -hmm. um, so you just take uh, dried mushrooms and grind them into a powder. And it's an addition that you would add to that Maryland fried chicken gravy, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, anchovies used to be used a lot. Um, a lot of people now would use fish sauce that you can get in the Vietnamese section of a grocery store. It's actually a pretty similar concept. You're just adding a little bit of salty umami. It's not really fishy. It's more just a, adding a rich flavor. Um, so things like that, just really techniques. And it's hard to even remember them all because cooking this way has really changed the way that I cook. So I don't even necessarily think about it while I'm doing it. Um, but a lot of old, re I recently made a recipe for Maryland cream waffles that was by a reader and I traced it back to Mrs. Benjamin Chu Howard's book. I got a waffle iron for my birthday. So I tried out this recipe and they were excellent. I've been making them ever since. So that's a new favorite for me. Um, and originally they were made with sour cream, which does not mean carton sour cream. It means cream that's gone sour, um, which would have tasted differently because it wasn't uh, pasteurized. So when you mix that with baking soda, it kind of has a reaction and leavens the waffles, but now they're made with baking powder for kind of the same effect. Cool. Uh, someone points out that Unicorn Books uh, that's in Trap, Maryland, always seems to have a huge collection of community cookbooks available. So that's a good tip. Um, I need to spend more time in there. I couldn't find, I guess I didn't find the, the section last time I was there, but um, that's a great place. I just, uh, you know, it's on the way to or from. Yeah. Um, but if you find anything good, let me know. <laughs> Another person points out that um, making beaten biscuits is a way to keep the kids occupied, or it would be a good way for a housewife to work out some of her frustrations. <laughs> you still yeah. have, you'd have to have a lot of time to do that, right? Um, John Shields from Baltimore, who has a restaurant here called Gertrude's, he used to have a public television show about Maryland food. And he has a cookbook of historic Maryland recipes and lots of anecdotes about that. Actually, he kind of wrote a whole monologue about what you would be thinking while you're beating the biscuits. As well. <laughs> I have to have the time to devote to that, right? Yeah. Um, there's another question about how, how do you quantify a recipe that you learned from someone who cooked by instinct? So for instance, um, Lynn says, my husband's Italian aunt taught me a number of things that I never see in cookbooks and I cook them by taste as well. Yeah, I think there's a lot that you just can't really put into recipes. And that's very special when you have those things that you've learned yeah. at someone's side, I think, and incorporated them. Um, I might have learned a few things, as I mentioned, just by cumulatively making these historic recipes. They've added to my knowledge. But I think a lot of times you can't quantify them. I showed a book called 300 Years of Black Cooking in St. Mary's County. And they made that book by asking these older women and trying to write down 
what they were making and their quantities, but everyone who was involved in the book apparently cooked mostly by instinct. So what you get in the book really isn't going to be quite the same. I mean, if you think about cooking something like greens, they might be more bitter one day or another. So you have to adjust your cooking by taste and you can't really quantify that in a cookbook, yeah. which is why cooking knowledge will always be very special and art. Um, Michelle Kretsch points out that Michigan State University has a great resource called Feeding America. It has online resources for cookbooks from the 18th century to the early 20th century. Yeah, I actually went there um, yeah. to look at their collections. They have a great culinary history, and so does um, Virginia Tech mm -hmm. has a lot of stuff online. And if you're interested in those corporate cookbooks, especially Jell-O, um, yeah. you know, condensed milk, those are always online and available for viewing and they do have a lot of interesting recipes and they're more historic than you would think it's not just it's not just a canned ingredient it's a part of culinary history yeah the, the all the the jello craze is really something um that we have jello molds and things in the museum collection uh they were it was such a good way to make colorful food um i mean before that it was a way to Put a whole bunch of things together in its aspect, but the colorful Jello certainly um, was popular in the 30s and 40s. Uh, someone calls says that muskrat is called marsh rabbit in Delaware. <laughs> yeah, I've heard that one. Um, I wish I could remember his name. There's a man that gives a talk about Maryland folklore, and he does a more in-depth talk about the muskrat. Um, I think there's also a muskrat festival on the Eastern Shore, so anyone who is intrigued by the muskrat stew might want to look that up. I also happen to notice in the spine of this, um, I've tried to flatten this picture out yeah. so that I can make myself a poster, but there is indeed a possum there. Yeah. Um, and it, you can see he's kind of next to the turkey in the spine of the book. Yeah. So, and I certainly do have recipes for, I have recipes for possum Maryland style and then Virginia style. I couldn't really tell what the difference was, but it was frequently eaten with sweet potatoes. Interesting. Uh, here's another um, mention of Holly's that was a restaurant that was over the Bay Bridge on Route 50. It was a great place for Maryland fried chicken. Uh, but yeah, that's gone now. I remember that restaurant too. Um, there's a question, do you have a, a full list of all the cookbooks in your collection? That's part of your database, I guess. Um, yeah, I haven't, I put it online. There's a link to it on my website, but I'm trying to update, update it a little bit more all the people because I'm always willing to copy recipes or look up recipes for people um, but it also includes my database also includes the library collections from the Pratt Library and Michigan um, so it includes a lot of other things but I usually have the library call numbers in there um, I also saw someone ask about the um, when the spelling of recipe changed from receipt um, and that was kind of just gradually during the late 1800s I'm not sure what um, you know, what even brought that about, but you start to see it really being fully adopted by around like 1910 or so with a few stragglers, of course, because a lot of cookbooks are often made by people who are being nostalgic or they just are old fashioned or, you know, are older. So sometimes you do st still see those stragglers um, up on through the thirties even. Um, someone asks if uh, the person you were referring to that the lecturer on Delmarva, um, History folklore was Mike Dixon. Um, yes, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Someone mentioned that, um, and um, I'm so bad with names. I'm so glad that yeah. someone <laughs> yeah got that down because I saw him speak at um, the Lock House in um, Tavern de Grace, but I think he does lectures around the state. So, and uh, someone looked up the um, Muskrat Fest, and it looks like that was in May of this year. So I have to wait a year, but. Um, and then a new question, how do you deal with recipes with sparse instructions, sometimes even leaving out quantities of ingredients? That's some of those early ones, right? Just said, grab this, grab that. Yeah, um, when I don't have my own instinct to fall back on, for instance, with the donuts, I've made them so many times, I just know what the dough and bread, especially I know what it's supposed to be like. Um, I Google a lot. So you can find other versions of recipes and I just compare them and try to find kind of a balance of everything you would find someone doing online. Um, that's the beauty of the Google age. You can find just about any recipe out there with 
uh, a million versions of it yeah. and even you know um the food network people like figuring out the best way to make that thing so i'll just follow their basic instructions but try to incorporate as much of the written recipe as possible right um i know on your blog this is a question that i had you um relatively recently mentioned that you don't always buy things on ebay sometimes they go too expensive but you got a really early cookbook right it was one of i think it was um a fairly early one that you were able to get uh from or, or was it one that the seller photographed for you i can't remember which no one. um yeah i actually i have a few where i personally i don't understand the market i don't understand what makes a cookbook expensive <laughs> and what what makes it cheap but there was one that was from the 1870s that I'd never seen before. And I figured it was gonna get up to be $400 and I'd never be able to buy that. So I wrote to the seller and I asked if they would photograph it for me and they agreed to, but I ended up winning it anyway um, for under a hundred, well under a hundred dollars. Um, it was like $70 or something, you know, that was my limit and um, yeah, sometimes I get lucky and often the digital copies are enough for me to put in the database. So I go to libraries and photograph things. Sometimes I'll see an auction and just find it in a library and then I don't have to have the expense. Right. And the space you need to store all that, right? Yeah, that's, that's <laughs> I had a picture of my, my bookshelf there with- uh, Yeah, that's a great photo. Uh, diminishing space. Um, someone uh, mentions that their mother had a handwritten recipe book. Oh, that's wonderful. She made in 42 as a newlywed and then a friend digitized it. Um, and the person writing in says they uploaded it to a Facebook group called Maryland is a cult. So um, I would love to see it anytime anything's digitized um, that people would be able to send me, you know, I just uh, save it as like a book copy and then I index the recipes and if people share personal family recipes, I always make sure to reach out to them before I would write about anything, just to make sure whether names or any um, personal information, um, you know, their mother's name or anything about their life. Um, so sometimes I'm just happy to have it in my database and the world at large will maybe never know about it until, uh, until I see the um, question actually about my collection for the future, which is yes. that I, plan to donate it to a library, um, either the Pratt Library, or I've had some talks with UMBC possibly, because um, they would have an ability to preserve the collection. So probably not anytime soon, um, unless something happens. But yeah, my plan is for it to all stay together because a lot of people have donated books to me. So I make sure to put the provenance, you know, this came from the mother-in-law of such and such, and they gave this to me. Um, so. I, I think that this whole collection and not just the recipes themselves, but also the cookbooks have all kinds of stories. Um, and also the pineapple rhubarb marmalade was delicious, um, but it was not shelf stable. So I had, it was a very large recipe. Um, and I think I ate as much of it as I could, but it got a little tiring. So that recipe is on my website, but if you make it, I would definitely cut it in, if not, um, quarter than halved at least, but it was a really good combination. I love strawberry rhubarb, so I was surprised by how good pineapple rhubarb was. It's an interesting combo. Um, and can people find you uh, if they come across a cookbook or have a family, you know, uh, cookbook or something, um, the best place to reach you is your through your blog, is that right? Is there an email address yeah. there? Um, yeah, I have my contact information on there. Um, or even if people are looking for a recipe, sometimes I'm can help people um, or sometimes the questions I can't necessarily find anything right away but I remember and if I come across it I'll contact someone later. Um, I've had people ask me about recipes that introduced me to traditions mm -hmm. that I didn't really know about. Someone reached out to me for a raisin bread recipe in the fall and ever since then I haven't found quite what they were looking for but now I'm as obsessed with finding it as <laughs> they are. If the, so now you're on the search, yeah. You're yeah, we're, yeah, we're in it together now. <laughs> That's great. Um, and just a shout out to any of you out there who have Greenbelt cookbooks. Uh, we have a few in the collection, the Women's Club cookbooks, and I think we have a few from 
we might have one from St. Hughes, but if any of you have them and are looking for a home for them, um, the museum would love to add it to our archives and our collection. And we will promise to share them um, with, with Kara if, uh, if, if it's one she doesn't have. I think she probably has quite a few, um, but there's, there's probably um, so many out there. There will keep, ones will keep turning up that uh, we don't know about, so. Yeah, that's the great thing about museums and libraries, um, you know, is that we're we're all in it together. And when things like that are um, available, they're available to everyone. I've donated a few of my, I used to donate some of my more rare books to libraries, but I've become a little bit more obsessed with keeping my collection whole for better or for worse. So for now, I'm holding on to um, a lot of my books. I saw somebody mention reproduction cookbooks. Um, and I just wanted to point out photo here. If you look next to my copy of Maryland's Way, you can see those um, books with the matching white spines. And those are actually, if you go online to Harvard Bookstore, you can have them print little copies on demand of some of the digitally available historic books. Um, so like these books were scanned by libraries like the New York Public Library and they were put online on usually on archive.org and you can order a nice little copy um, and I really love those uh, so I just wanted to mention that for anyone who likes reproduction cookbooks because I'm of the same mind I just like to have the information I don't need to collect the uh, well you know having the having the old book is fun but we can't always have that luxury so sometimes the little reproduction are nice and it shows people's little handwritten notes in the in the copy that was scanned and things like that they make a really nice, nice gift. That's right. So I think we're probably um, about out of time. Any any last questions? Just one or two last questions before we sign off. No. Well, this has been absolutely fascinating. Thank you so much uh, for speaking tonight. Um, I loved all your slides and uh, the information. The history is fascinating. So I encourage everybody. Um, to go and please, someone wants the um, wants your old line plate .com. I encourage everybody to go take a look at Kara's blog. Um, it, you can just it's a you can go down the rabbit hole and spend a lot of time actually reading about all the different recipes. I will to put my email in there. Um, you know, just for if you had a specific recipe question, because the blog I know, I'm well aware it's a lot of information to go through. So sometimes it's not so easy to find, especially if you're looking for something specific. That's right. Yeah. Um, so we will, uh, we will be um, putting more information out about our retro town fair. It's a nice tie in, I think with, uh, you know, you can get out all your, your old recipes for uh, cakes and pies and cookies. And, and then there's also the canning. Um, and we are again, so grateful to Kara for coming and speaking with us. Um, please do get in touch if you guys find various cookbooks in your, um, in the backs of your cabinets or the, the back of your bookshelf that maybe you haven't seen in a while. Um, and as I said before, this is recorded, so it will be on our, um, YouTube channel, the museum's YouTube channel, and you'll also be able to access it from our blog on our website. Um, so thanks so much, everyone, uh, and we'll see you next time. All right, thank you all so much and thanks for chatting with me and um, hopefully we can do this again sometime. Yes, yes. Thanks again. Have a good night. Okay, bye-bye.